This will be very much a means of an introduction to brain tumors and relevant neuroanatomy, and I'll try, try and cover um, many of the most common subtypes of predominantly adult brain, brain tumors, but I do have some slides on the pediatric brain tumors as well. So in Nottingham, we, we do research on, on, uh, on both uh, adult and pediatric. And as this is a study day, I thought I'd begin by stating what the key learning objectives are for the talk. By the end of the talk, you should be able to describe the common clinical presentations of intracranial tumors, i.e. brain tumors, to describe the most common of those primary brain tumors and their relevant neuroanatomy and also the prognosis of some of these. And finally, to also list the common tumors that occur, that arise outside the brain. As you'll see during the talk, um, it's, one, it, it's a very frequent occurrence and many of the solid tumors we're familiar with in the body, they preferentially metastasize to the brain. Okay, so the tumors that affect the brain and central nervous system can be divided into two categories. Uh, one is called extrinsic, and these are tumors that arise effectively outside the brain, so they're not directly tumors that are occurring from inside the brain. And these can, can arise from the bone, uh, they can arise from the meninges, or they can arise from nerve tissue. So the meninges is three connective layers um, that envelop the brain and spinal cord, and the most proximal to the skull of these uh, layers is called the dura. So you get, certainly in adults, it's very common to get tumors that are um, arising from the meninges. But they, uh, as mentioned, they can also be metastatic. Uh, they can be uh, malignant tumors that have arisen in other parts of the body, other solid tumors that then find their way up into the brain, unfortunately. The second category is what's called intrinsic tumors, and so these are the classical primary tumors that occur in the brain, and they are normally comprising brain cells or cells in the spinal cord. So you can see here in this, so the, so the intrinsic tumors are all, they all occur either in the forebrain, which is called the cerebrum, or the hindbrain, the rear part of the brain, which is called the cerebellum, and you have some tumors that uh, originate in the spinal cord. So cancer is a disease of cells, it's a biological disease. So that follow, it follows that the um, origin, the cell of origin that gives rise to these tumors are um, the cells that we find in normal brain. So these can be divided into two categories. Um, you have neurons and you have glial cells. I'm sorry about the text there. And the glial cells can be divided up to astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So what follows is that when these cells effectively lose regulation, lose control, uh, this is by virtue of a whole bunch of different types of mutations, both genetic and non-genetic. Um, when that happens, um, these cells can give rise to a transformed or malignant cell. So you have neuronal tumors and you have glial tumors that are broken into astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas. Uh, this has all become clear during the, the following slides. So, um, as I said, so the, the cells, the normal cells give rise to brain tumors, but of course, the, in principle, it is just one cell that has acquired sufficient mutations and sufficient abnormal changes that then triggers the growth of that tumor. We, unfortunately, in our field, we can never diagnose patients at such an early stage. It'll become clear during this talk, because this is one of the most fundamental problems we have in trying to treat, certainly, the malignant brain cancers. At the time we see these patients, it, the disease is already at a very late stage. But in principle, this cartoon shows what, at some point, is happening when the patients are effectively asymptomatic. Um, it's not terribly easy for this to happen. You, you, the brain is a very well-protected organ. Um, that's why it's very rare to get infections in the brain. Lifestyle factors don't really, there was no evidence that it, it impacts mutations in the brain as such. So unfortunately, it's a real mystery as to this, this early stage of how cancers develop. But in principle, something like this will happen where you have one particular cell, a neuron or, or a glial cell, and throughout the, the course of that patient's life, it has acquired sufficient number of changes. Um, most of these are, are mutational. And one that, once that burden becomes, um, it passes a certain threshold, there is a very likelihood that that cell could become tumorigenic. And once that happens, that is really the, the origin of the tumor, and then it will rapidly grow. Um, some of the uh, myths, I guess, I, I want to dispel as well. When I moved into the field 10, 10 years ago or so, um, certainly the public perception was, compared to some of the other tumors such as leukemias, breast, certain breast cancers, um, it, it was perceived that brain tumors generally, pediatric and adult, 
are, are pretty rare, but the evidence doesn't bear. And um, with a lot of the public uh, awareness campaign, particularly the Brain Tumor Charity has, has been involved in, um, we're breaking this um, uh, misconception to the public. But here's some of the statistics to back it up. So th there's an increase in incidence of primary brain tumors in the UK. It's around 10,000 at the moment in the UK. And this is almost directly related to the aging population we have. So in, in, in one respect is because medicine has made such strides, but the flip side is some of the tumors have longer um, to, to manifest. The result of that is about 5,000 people annually um, uh, succumb to the disease in the UK. In children, um, brain tumors as a whole are the second most commonest group of tumors only behind leukemia, but yet it's the leading cause of death. Um, in adults, it's the sixth commonest group of, of tumors when all cancers are considered together. And uh, in patients under the age of 45, it accounts for almost 11% of cancer deaths in the UK, but when you include the um, brain tumors that arise from other parts of the, uh, of the body, around 13% of patients that die from cancer have brain or central nervous system involvement. And some of the statistics um, regarding the pediatric tumor, so this is Cancer Research UK statistics, just highlighting the, the, the point I just made there, that in children it, it's the most common solid tumor only behind leukemias, but yet when you look at survival, it is the, it is the biggest killer in, in, in children. Similarly, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty dismal uh, picture for adult brain tumors as well. This is all adult um, malignant brain tumors showing that the overall five-year survival is, not only is it poor, what you'll notice is this graph goes right back to the 1970s. And uh, one of the things um, is really been disappointing is that um, we're in an era of huge advances in, in cancer as a, in, in, in general. Many of the cancers that were um, really poorly treated decades ago have really good outcomes now. So the really disappointing thing is despite continuing um, in, in terms of research, um, clini clinical uh, uh, research going on, working with these tumors, that has increased almost exponentially, but yet 30, 40 years we've seen the same uh, outcome in terms of survival. And what's really disappointing about this is that when you look at the general trend for all cancers, uh, you can see here that these are uh, Cancer Research UK statistics that cancer survival has doubled since the 1970s. So um, the cancer research is not a gloomy story when you look at it holistically and, and, and all the research has gone on all cancer together. But yet brain tumors have seen almost no advancement um, based on, on the research that has been done worldwide. So if we look at, start looking at the tumor incidences between adult and childhood, um, on the left you can see that the um, some of the most common brain tumors are um, high-grade gliomas, uh, which are called glioblastoma. We're going to look at all these in, in much more detail uh, later on. Um, but in contrast, the most common childhood brain tumors are uh, medulloblastomas and also this category here, which are low-grade astrocytomas. So we'll look at the, um, the manifestation of these tumors and the prognosis in a little bit more detail throughout this lecture. So one of the things... Uh, Colleagues that are um, unfamiliar to the brain cancer field often ask me, and it's a very valid question, what, how do brain cancers arise? And it's a very sensible question because we know from many other cancers in the body, you can attribute hereditary factors if it's, if it's family history. You can, you can associate lifestyle factors as some contribution. But there's no real direct evidence that we can look at anything in a person's lifestyle um, that, can, that can hint at, as to why they've developed a cancer um, later on in life. There is some anecdotal evidence. None of these have been backed up by clinical trials, and you, you probably now and again came across some of this in the media, um, links to mobile phone usage, uh, radiation exposure in childhood, certain genetic factors that may be predispositions. But in terms of run, um, proper controlled clinical trials to identify whether this is causal, um, we, we, the field hasn't seen that. So at the moment, the etiology or why do brain cancers arise it is something that is extremely difficult, even from a, a scientific perspective, to come up with how would we address this. It is just extremely difficult. And I touched on the issue earlier that when we get um, samples from patients' brains, it's already a very late-stage disease. So we, we have to begin our um, scientific hypotheses on a very malignant disease and base our therapy at that late stage, whereas in principle, the earlier we can, we can catch the disease, um, you know, potentially would have a better outcome. 
But what we do know from um, the, the decades of research is that childhood brain cancer in general, in general and adult brain cancer probably do differ in how they arise. Um, the evidence indicates that in a child's brain, which is still developing, where many, many areas of the brain are still have dividing cells, it is regarded as a developmental biology disorder. And so this is where you probably, uh, the, the, the tumor doesn't need an awful lot of mutations to have acquired because some of those changes are already in place. And this is in contrast to adult brain cancer where it's more the classical model that you see in other cancers where during a person's lifetime, slowly cells are, are acquiring mutations and then at one point if one cell has uh, a sufficient burden, it will transform into a cancer cell. So there is a difference between how we believe these cancers arise in children and adults. But this, this, this attribution to uh, uh, causation is a real difficult thing in science in general. In my own group, um, we quite often look at data in this field and we think we found a causal link, but more often than not, it's a correlation that probably doesn't mean an awful lot. And it's really, really difficult in science to, to design experiments where you can attribute cause. Let me give you an example of this fallacy. I, I digress for a second. This was a genuine study um, conducted in the late 1990s by the British Medical uh, Journal. And they asked the question that, what is the most dangerous job in the United Kingdom? I'm not sure what the, the objective for the study was. And uh, as expected, um, it's, it's, it was not as expected the uh, professions such as bomb disposal expert, uh, steeplejack, or F1 driver. And they found that the most difficult job was having a role in one of our most well-known soap operas. So this is a genuine study. You can get the paper, uh, 1997. And the point I'm trying to make is that what does this tell us about causa causation? In terms of the most dangerous profession, it, it tells us nothing at all. So similarly, we, we, it's really difficult to attribute causation to how these brain tumors originate biologically. OK, so if we start looking at the clinical symptoms um, for both extrinsic tumors and intrinsic tumors. So extrinsic, extrinsic tumors that arise outside of the brain, um, they typically compress the brain or spinal cord. And because they do so, you tend to get uh, focal neurological signs, and these uh, also cause symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. Similarly, but there is some distinctions, those tumors that arise in the brain, they infiltrate the brain or spinal cord, where you also get focal um, neurological symptoms, but because of the, um, the brain, uh, the abnormal brain cells growing, you tend to get brain swelling, uh, and you, you get intracranial pressure. And one of the things with these symptoms, if you're an adult patient, you can um, quite clearly communicate this to your GPs and to your doctors. Um, one of the issues is that if you consider some of the early telltale symptoms for brain tumors, and you consider, um, say, if we look at the middle bracket, if you consider children from the age of uh, five to 11 years old, um, some of these symptoms, such as uh, a balance, loss of balance and coordination, mild headache, maybe vomiting, if, you have, if your child has one of those symptoms, I'm sure you can appreciate the difficulty in, in jumping to a conclusion thinking that a, a brain tumor may be the cause of that. And then when you consider that on average, GPs in the UK throughout their practice, their career, they will see one to three um, children that actually have a brain tumor. So a campaign began, some of you may be familiar with this, it originated in the University of Nottingham. It's been funded by the Brain Tumor Charity and it's a campaign to help GPs and parents of children to um, rapidly diagnose children who may have some of the symptoms of brain tumors. So these are little um, cards and checklists that appear in GP practices and surgeries in the waiting rooms. And the idea is that if your child has more than one of these symptoms, you should request the GP to ask for an urgent referral. And this has been going on for several years now, so the data that we have shows that the um, diagnosis time has been significantly reduced because of this campaign. And this has been a huge public uh, awareness campaign, and it shows really the benefit of, of, of a campaign such as this. OK, so in terms of the clinical presentation of, of brain tumors, you have two categories. One is low-grade tumors, which are, um, because they begin as benign tumors that then slowly grow, the brain can accommodate this growth. And you tend to get slow pressure rises. Um, and they are associated most likely with some seizures or focal neurology. In contrast, the high-grade malignant tumors, because of the rapid growth um, these tumors have, 
the brain tends to struggle with this rapid rise and you're more likely to, to present with um, symptoms of pressure. And so the, just to reiterate the common brain tumors that I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail now in terms of the, the histology and the biology. So the, the most common brain tumors are secondary. So these are the metas metastatic tumors that arise from other parts of the body. Um, when I first found out this, I was surprised that they are the most common category of brain tumors because it's the organ that is um, preferentially um, the organ that uh, the tumor cells metastasize to. We don't really know why that is. Um, primary brain tumors uh, such as the astrocytomas and gliomas, which can be high and low grade, and meningiomas are, all, are also a very common brain tumor. Um, in, in the Queen's Medical Center in Nottingham, uh, meningiomas are, uh, we, we see an awful lot of meningiomas. Then you have some rarer uh, brain tumors. Some of these are pediatric, which are called ependymoma, medulloblastoma, and PNET, choroid plexus, which is um, a bundle of, of nerve tissue, and a tumors arising from a gland called the pineal gland, which is a small gland that secretes a, a hormone-like substance. So as I said, the most common type of brain tumor, unfortunately, are those that are metastatic. Uh, they most likely uh, commonly come from the breast, lung, bone, melanomas or the kidney, and they, they often spread to the brain. Um, I, I, my research team, we attend uh, surgical theater mainly for glioblastoma operations to collect research samples, um, and quite often we've been there where on, a, on an MRI diagnosis it, it's deemed that a patient has got a glioblastoma, a grade four brain tumor. Um, surgeon begins to operate. As they start resecting that brain tissue, what comes out can only be described as it looks like tar. And what it is is that it's a melanoma that um, the, the, what gives pigment to, to, to our, our skin is expression of the protein melanin. So when patients have skin cancers, you have really high expression, abnormal expression of this um, pigment producing protein melanin. So the brain tumors, or the core of it, is, is thick black and it's very tar-like. So it's only at that point does the neurosurgical team realize that it, it is not a glioblastoma. Um, and the, the cases that I've attended, it, it's where the patient's history has no, um, there, there is no history of the primary skin cancer that the patient had. So it, it had gone undetected, um, asymptomatic, and then unfortunately they then present with a, with a metastatic melanoma that uh, um, on a brain scan we can't distinguish from a, a glioblastoma. Um, quite often they can be multiple tumors as well, so you don't just get one metastatic site, you tend to get what's called the machine gun effect. I'm gonna show you some autopsy pictures soon. Um, and we see that a lot where you get a multiple um, uh, sites where the, the metastatic tumor has gone up. Treatment options for metastatic tumors can uh, vary between, unfortunately, when if it's very, very metastatic, uh, palliation has to be considered as, as one of the, the main options. In occasion, surgery, um, stereotactic radiosurgery, where you have radiotherapy to a very precise area of the brain, or even whole brain radiotherapy could be considered, but of course, um, uh, there's a lot of side effects to be considered uh, with, with this kind of aggressive therapy. And here's some autopsy sections. So you can see here that, um, so this is what I was talking about. I was nicknamed uh, a machine gun effect, where this is a, a number of metastatic foci within the brain. Patient, and, it, it's possible that palliation is, is the only option when you, when you have such a, a, an aggressive metastatic tumor. Um, a lot of these metastatic um, tumors arise in the gray and white matter junction, and quite often in the hindbrain or the cerebellum. And about 30% of all brain tumors are metastatic, and of that 30%, the most common is um, those that arise in the lung, and then followed by breast cancer and, and kidney cancers. And if untreated, the median survival is a very, very dismal one to two months for this, this category of patients. So if we move on to the intrinsic primary brain tumors, and we're gonna cover um, the high-grade astrocytomas, which will include glioblastoma, the low-grade astrocytomas, and meningiomas. So you, I think you um, maybe had a talk in the morning or you, you have one coming up on the um, tumor nomenclature and the way these tumors are graded and diagnosed. So this is usually the, 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 the job of a neuropathologist and quite often they will diagnose it during the operation. They'll take a, a, a section, smear it, do some staining. And this is typically what they look at. So they, they are trying to identify this cell of origin. If you think of the, the early slides, we know that um, when a cancer forms in the brain, it's originated from a neuron or, an or a glial cell. So if they can identify the cell type, they, they know what type 
a tumor we, the, the clinical team may be dealing with. They also look at things that help them grade the tumor. So the higher the grade, the more malignant the tumor. And they look at things such as uh, pleomorphism, and these are all um, abnormal morphological changes that occur in individual cells. So a trained neuropathologist can identify healthy looking cell and cells that have lost their, their shape and, um, and, 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 and uh, their growth pattern. Um, they, they can identify um, high levels of cell division. So one simple way of doing that is the amount of cells, the density of cells you see on a slide compared to normal brain. You can see here those, these little, um, little round drops here. These are all uh, areas of very high um, um, vascular proliferation, which is this, the, the tumor cells borrowing the normal brain's blood supply, and also they have the ability to create their own blood supply. So you get this really, in any given tissue, in any given histological slide, you see a lot of evidence of blood vessels. And you also see something called necrosis, which is dead tissue. So one of the things um, is very common in very malignant tumors is that you do get a lot of cell death as well as a lot of cell division. So if you go into the middle of, in the core of a tumor during an operation, you tend to find dead tissue. And, and it's mainly because of the lack of oxygen um, in, in the core of tumors. And you get proliferating cells on the periphery of the tumors. Um, so the, the four grades, so the grade, grade one tumors are low grade. They tend to be curative in many cases with surgery alone. The grade two astrocytomas um, are also considered low grade. I'm gonna to come to this in another slide because these are very enigmatic tumors and they present one of the most difficult decisions uh, and, and, and um, communication is very difficult for uh, the clinical team and the patients as to the prognosis of these, this category of tumor. The grade three tumors are high grade um, anaplastic astrocytomas and the, the most malignant grade is grade four, which is glioblastoma, uh, and the outcome can be pretty poor for these high-grade tumors. So if we just look at the histological gradient of the astrocytomas, just a little bit more detail. The grade ones are referred to as pilocytic astrocytomas. Um, they don't divide, they do divide, but they divide very slowly. They're more common in children and young adults, and the outcome tends to be pretty good for that uh, category of patients. The grade two, uh, uh, Astrocytomas are called uh, diffuse astrocytomas. They grow a little bit um, um, more quickly, and the, they're typically uh, arise in young adults. Grade three is, um, sorry, as, as I mentioned, so be, this, this grade two category is enigmatic because although surgery quite often is, um, has a very, very good outcome, they don't need chemo or radiotherapy, unfortunately, in a number of these patients, several years on, that tumor will progress into a high-grade glioma. So the, the conversation with patients that um, neurosurgeons and neuro-oncologists have is extremely difficult because we don't have any scientific evidence to look at um, any marker, any, any, any clue at this stage of a disease and say to these young adults that you may do very well in several years or you have a potential for a tumor to come back and when it comes back, it's gonna be an incurable brain cancer. So you can appreciate how difficult that conversation is um, and it's an area of, of research that brain tumor charity are, are prioritizing um, um, with their grant calls. They're looking for um, people to address this issue, how we can better predict which patients will have a, a progression from a low-grade glioma. You ha then you have the high-grade categories, anaplastic uh, astrocytomas, which are, tend to occur in uh, patients around 30 to 60 years old, and these are more aggressive. And then finally, you've got the very aggressive glioblastoma, um, and this, the, the, the median age is around 50 to 70 years. So the, this is again just, just looking in a little bit more detail. So the grade two astrocytomas, these are the enigmatic tumors. Um, they may have a very long history. Um, and unfortunately for some patients, this is uh, after that long interval, this tumor can come back. But when it comes back, it is no longer a low grade. It is, it is transformed into a, in a grade four. It tends to be a, a grade four uh, glioblastoma at that stage. Uh, grade threes, um, th this is also a high-grade tumor, so the patients tend to be unwell. They do have a shorter history than the grade twos. Um, it, it occurs in, in slightly older patients, and some of these will have uh, progressed, as I mentioned, from a grade two tumor. And finally, you've got the, the very malignant glioblastomas with a very short history, um, which is about three months. So this is, again, you've got such a large cortical lesion in the brain, but quite often these patients are asymptomatic for an awful long time with this tumor growing. They present with a seizure, um, and typically that, the decision will then be made to have a, quite a radical operation quite soon. 
and then they, they, they have aggressive chemo radiotherapy. So this really makes it uh, very difficult from a research perspective because at this stage we, we see these patients. So this just summarizes the prognosis of those four uh, grades of tumors together along with the very common meningiomas that we see. So they're the tumors on the surface of the brain, on the meninges. And, and this is just reiterating those previous slides where you get a pretty good outcome uh, with meningiomas. Surgery tends to be curative and the grade ones, um, um, particularly the uh, pediatric grade ones, uh, surgery tends to be curative. And then you can see the survival drop off as you go on to the grade twos, uh, and effectively the grade threes and grade fours are, uh, you don't like using the word incurable, but they're, they're pretty resistant to a lot of therapies, uh, multimodal therapies. Um, if I just show you the glioblastoma prognosis a little bit more detail because this is the one, and um, this is the most common malignant tumor we see, and this is the most devastating tumor. And this is a tumor my own research team work a lot, an awful lot with. So just to reiterate, it's a, a WHO grade four glial tumor. It's the most pre prevalent and aggressive malignant brain tumor with an incidence that's uh, pretty constant worldwide. It's about two to three per 100,000. So this is an MRI image of a very, very large glioblastoma, and typically this is the stage we, we see the patients and, and the stage that we get research samples from that tumor to study. And if you just look at this survival curve and just look at the, the orange line, so the orange line are those patients who are fit enough, um, they are well enough to receive very aggressive surgery, and then three or four days later, an intense six-week course of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And if they have all that multimodal treatment, the median survival is about 14 months. So what that really means is that this is, none of these treatments are, are effective really in any way. It, it is, it is um, uh, it, it, surgery is the only um, intervention that has um, a relatively significant um, positive outcome um, because the chemo radiotherapy, some patients respond, some don't. The other lines where you can see the survival drop off to be even poorer, that is because a lot of the patients, especially elderly patients that have got glioblastoma, it's a very, very aggressive treatment regime. So if they're not fit to receive all that therapy, they may have surgery alone or maybe chemo or radiotherapy alone. And then the median survival is even lower than 14 months. And if you consider that the majority of people in the world that work in brain cancer research and the majority of funding historically has probably gone to this disease, huge efforts in North America over the years we attend a lot of these big conferences and 80%, and 90% of the delegates will work on this disease. And yet, we have seen almost no improvement in survival 50, 60 years. And as a, as a biologist like myself, it's, it's pretty humbling in that we haven't made any progress in this because, as I said, the, the only indicator of, of better survival is the amount of surg surgical resection um, that, will, that will take place. And if you consider the this is just a summary. And if you consider the very, very first um, neurosurgical resection of a glioblastoma took place in 1884, um, two gentlemen called Bennett and Godley. This is Bennett here on the left. Um, this took place in, in London. Um, if you consider that we haven't improved really in for glioblastoma in terms of prognosis based on all this molecular biology area, genetics, um, we, we live in a genomics and post-genomics era, and, and there's been a lot of fancy work that's gone into this tumor, and yet we, we, we've, surgery remains the best indicator of survival. And incidentally, some of, some of you may have visited this hospital. Um, it was the uh, neurological hospital in Regent's Park in London. You may have visited it inadvertently because it was then broken down to make way for the current London Zoo. Okay, so. Stay, we're staying with glioblastoma for the next few slides. So in terms of the surgical option, um, uh, there's a number of things to consider. I think you heard from uh, a neurosurgeon earlier on today, so I hope it's not too repetitive for you. In unfit patients, um, a lot of them tend to be elderly patients. One of the options may be no surgery because there isn't a perceived benefit uh, because of the side effects during that procedure and the risks. So if the, if the glioblastoma is in areas that the neurosurgeon refers to as eloquent, which means it's, it's in really close proximity to areas that are linked to speech, vision, motor neuron function, they may make a decision that they won't operate. Sometimes you have a tumor which is too difficult to surgically resect, but you can, you can get a small biopsy. So that might be one consideration. So that helps with the diagnosis and the chemotherapy choice potentially. Then in other cases where the patient is fit and the tumor is in a location that they can be more aggressive, they'll do one of three things. They can debulk, which means they take quite
quite a lot of the tumor out, but they know that there's some of the tumor that they, they will have to leave behind as macroscopic and visible. Then you have what they call macroscopic res resection is where they will take out almost everything they can see. Um, of course, unfortunately, these um, diseases are very infiltrative, so there is tumor that remains that the neurosurgeon cannot see, and that is why they're, they're um, uh, incurable. And the final one is something that's, uh, it's, it's, it's in recent years, last two, three years, it, through an innovative method, the neurosurgeons can remove not just everything they can see, but a little bit more. So I'm just gonna show you this video, but it's not gonna, I think I've lost some novelty factor because I've heard that the neurosurgeon early on has showed you one of his patients. So I'm gonna show you the five ALA um, surgery. So our, our neurosurgical colleagues in Nottingham have been doing this for a, a year or two. And just to um, uh, summarize what it is, our patients take a drink uh, four hours before surgery, and the drink contains a substrate that gets taken up in the body, and a particular biochemical pathway in glioblastoma cells have high, exp high expression of enzymes in this pathway, and what it does, it turns the substrate into a product that emits pink fluorescence. And what the neurosurgeons then do is that they, they debulk as much of the tumor they can see, and then they operate with a fluorescent microscope, and it gives them an option to vis visibly detect tumor that in the with the naked eye they couldn't see. So they are resecting more of the material. At least it gives them an option to see, is it safe to resect more of the material? Um, so just, this is, uh, just before I show you that, this is uh, one of the things they use routinely in, in the operations to help with the, the, the image guidance, both fluorescence and non-fluorescence. Um, in surgical theater, they, they wheel this uh, device, it's called a stealth station, and all the MRI CT scans of that patient is, is included in this um, um, stealth station. And what this does is that when the surgeon is operating, they have a real-time um, uh, image of that person's tumor, the location of the tumor, where to conduct the removal of the skull, and then how to safely uh, start resecting that tumor. The only drawback of this is because it is real time, as the, they start operating, the brain starts shrinking, so there is a, a discrepancy between what they see um, on the stealth station and what they're actually seeing uh, during the operation. And as I said, so they, they, once they debulk the tumor, they turn off the lights and they operate under a fluorescent microscope. So, yeah, so, so this would be the stage of the operation where there was a large glioblastoma here. The neurosurgeon has removed everything they can visibly see, uh, and years gone by, this would have been the end of the operation. Um, but now what they do is they turn on the, the filters, and because uh, the residual cells that are on the margins um, will emit bright pink fluorescence, it gives them an option to remove more of the tumor. So this, this area here, um, which looks very much like normal brain, see pinpricks of pink light, which is, which is great in terms of the amount of material they can um, uh, remove, but also from a research perspective, if you consider that those pinpricks of tumor cells are the tumors that give, they are the cells that give rise to the regrowth of that tumor. From a research perspective, this is revolutionizing some of the questions we can ask. Okay, so finally, just, uh, I've just got a few more minutes, and I, um, I want to just, in just a few slides, summarize where the research field is, um, because ultimately, um, surgery, um, can only go so far, and really with the five ALA surgery, it's difficult to see how a neurosurgeon in the future will take more out because it's just simply not safe to go into those areas of the brain. So the, the only way we're gonna um, in, improve treatment for these diseases is to understand the biology better so we can better inform chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy. So the research worldwide involved in all these malignant brain tumors is to improve diagnosis, treatment, to identify better prognostic markers to detect the tumor early, um, better research into palliative care and survivorship, and the research concerns both basic fundamental research because we need to know biologically what goes wrong, but then how we rapidly translate that to, to clinical trials. And if I just give you an example um, um, of using glioblastoma again, that we, about 20 years ago when I was an undergraduate, it was, it was during the time where the human genome was sequenced, huge excitement because it was seen as a, a, a great human achievement, it took seven years to do, seven billion dollars, and that was to sequence seven Caucasian males from the United States. Huge task, multiple countries around the world. And as students, we were told this will be something that um, in the future it, it, will, it will impact the way we do res all kinds of research in medicine, but practically speaking, sequencing genomes of patients, it's just too expensive, it takes too long. 
But like everything else, um, this era since then, in the last 20 years, uh, to say the uh, development has been exponential would be an understatement, because today it costs almost just almost 100 pound only to sequence a cancer patient's genome. It takes about two weeks. If you think $7 billion, seven years for seven patients, and now, you, now a moderately sized research group is expected to sequence genomes, not just look at one gene, 100 genes, you have to look at all of them because we have the technological capability. So it's quite extraordinary, really. Um, so glioblastoma benefited from this. Uh, in about 2010, the NIH in America, they decided we're going to tackle this disease, we're going to sequence 1,000 glioblastoma, glioblastoma patients' genomes. And when they did that, this, uh, this genetic data on the right, this is called, uh, it's called a heat map. And what it basically showed for the first time was if you have glioblastoma, you have one of four diseases. Um, everything in red here is any particular gene, any key uh, um, oncoprotein, a key uh, cancer-causing uh, gene, if it is abnormally upregulated, which means it's got multiple copies rather than just the two copies in a normal cell, it, it comes up red. So just to give one example, this category here, this is a subtype called proneural, and they defined it as characterized by one particular gene called PDGFR, a, and those patients were subtyped into that category. So they follow the same thing for these other categories, and the net result is you were pigeonholing glioblastoma um, patients for the first time ever, and there was huge excitement in the field because the obvious thing is then to tailor therapy against that particular mutation that is a driver of your subtype. So what followed was a plethora of clinical trials um, over the next two, three years, um, and it can be summarized in the following slide. We saw no objective response in any phase two clinical trial. Um, and it, 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 was, it was the mo it was a, there's never been such intense a period of so many clinical trials over, over a period. And my final slide is I can just summarize why this is the case and where the field is now by one ana analogical slide, if I may. So, um, so every year I think they know the questions to ask, even if they don't know the answer. So we're no different. We think we can answer why um, all those uh, single agent therapies targeting one, um, one mutation did not work. So if you use the analogy of a tree, so if you begin with, and, we, and the, this is going to relate to genetic mutations, and again, I'm sticking to glioblastoma here. So if you look at the trunk of a tree, these are mutations that occurred very early on in the tumor, so they, we can regard them as ancestral, if you like. And every descendant of that um, cell will have that mutation. But when um, the field, the glioblastoma field, started to um, look at different regions of the same patient's tumor, so it's a concept called intratumor heterogeneity. What they found was really alarming, but it's something that um, we, need, we needed to know. So um, what you tend to find is you have some cells that have this, uh, mutations that are common across every cell of that patient's tumor, but as that cancer grows, you have s certain cells that acquire new mutations, and then we call them subclones, and they're in the same patient's uh, uh, tumor. So they, they'll start acquiring mutations that are shared maybe between one or more subclones, but then it gets even more alarming because then we also have evidence now that as the tumor branches out, you have subclones that have acquired unique mutations that are facilitating the growth in that region of the tumor. So you have this, this concept of a very uh, high degree of biological information that differs between different areas of the tumor. So this is a, a, quite a startling clue as to why if you just target one of these branches, and one of these driver oncoproteins, your, those clinical trials probably did work in terms of eliminating that subclone, but the problem is another branch with another subclone was able to repopulate the tumor. So as we go forward, the future has to be multi-agent clinical trials, so there's a real question there how pharmaceutical companies who spend an awful lot just to put one drug through, how will we engage them, how do we convince them that we now have to try and, um, multiple agents in clinical trials. But that's, that's where the glioblastoma field is now. We know why probably treatment has been so, so poor over this, uh, for this disease. So I'll stop there. I think that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and also to reiterate any slide that wasn't clear um, in the remaining time. But thank you.